In the mid-1950s, the Central Vermont Railway was busily writing the final chapters of steam railroading in southern New England. Two enthusiastic rail fans were equally busy with their 8mm movie cameras to preserve that chapter for all of us. Bill Radcliffe Sr., then of Webster, Massachusetts, would often pack his family, a picnic basket, and his camera into the automobile for a Saturday of rail fanning the Central Vermont's Palmer subdivision between Brattleboro, Vermont and New London, Connecticut. Andy Schools, fresh out of the service, with his new camera in hand, set out with a vengeance to capture the final hours of steam. Andy roamed the southern division of the CV from St. Albans, Vermont to New London, Connecticut. Thanks to the dedication of these fans, we can now take you back to the Central Vermont Railway in steam. The Palmer sublocal freights were in the hands of the CV's feisty and fast-running consolidations. We see a 280-powered local freight running on the northern end of the Palmer sub at Vernon, Vermont. A few miles to the south, another local passes the Millers Falls, Massachusetts depot, then climbs the grade on Belchertown Hill, also in Massachusetts. CV-280s were in two classes, the M3A class, numbers 450 through 455, and the N5A class, numbers 460 through 475. The M3s were out of Alco in 1916 with 57-inch drivers. The N5s, with 63-inch drivers, came from the Alco Schenectady Works in 1923. We see a local in Three Rivers, Massachusetts, approaching the yard limits at Palmer. Palmer to East New London local is running this Saturday with N5A number 472. Bill Cotter in Stafford Springs, Connecticut, at the south end of the long state line passing siding, in Tallinn, Connecticut, at the sweeping curve to the west of Highway 32, and in Willington, Connecticut. The Central Vermont Railway has been a subsidiary of the Canadian National Railway and its predecessors since before the turn of the century. In the more recent past, it has come under the umbrella of the Grand Trunk Corporation, CN's United States operating arm. The main line connects the CN to the deepwater port of East New London, Connecticut. Since 1860, headquarters have been in St. Albans. The shops are still there, as is Italy Yard, the major classification facility. Our material covers the southern division between St. Albans and New London, and the cities of Essex Junction, White River Junction, and Brattleboro, Vermont, with Massachusetts communities such as Millers Falls, Amherst, Belchertown, and Palmer. In Connecticut, Stafford Springs, Willimantic, and New London are among the online cities. Another local is seen crossing the bridge at Yannick, Connecticut. The Palmer subdivision extended from Brattleboro to East New London. The CV has always maintained its right of way in an immaculate condition. Andy found Palmer sub work extra 452 at Stafford Springs. The crew invited him up on the engine for a short ride. We also watched the work train from the ground.
Stafford Springs is an old Connecticut mill town, and even in 1956, the local always had work there. We watch as the 450 putters around the yard, ties on to her northbound train, and departs. A quick ride north on Connecticut Route 32 gets us to the north end of the state line passing siding. The 450 was the only M3 with an Alesco feed water heater. The others had the coffin heaters. She's hurrying north to Palmer Yard and the end of her day's work. State line was favored for meets by CV dispatchers. Bill captured two meets at the south end of the siding. First, southbound number 451 holds the main with its train, while number 472, running light, takes the siding. After the departure of 451, the 472 backs onto the main and resumes her trip to Palmer. Canadian National EMDs on a northbound manifest, probably train number 429, pass CV 450 in the hole. The CV has always been cooperative at operating excursions and fan trips. In 1956, the Amherst, Massachusetts Grange sponsored an excursion to New London. They borrowed passenger equipment from the New Haven Railroad and assigned number 466 for power. Bill captured the special running through Palmer Yard southbound. He caught up with the train in East New London Yard. The locomotive, after being serviced and turned, backs to the coaches for the return trip.
After tying on, the train departs for home in Amherst. Andy caught a similar northbound special rounding the curve through Stafford Springs Yard. This beautiful run-by was at Munson, Massachusetts, just south of Palmer. At St. Albans, Andy has captured an ethereal view of number 451 with its distinctive coffin feed water heater being tended to by the hostler. The CV has been headquartered at St. Albans since about 1860. All major locomotive service is performed in the shops. The hostlers are busy preparing the 472 and 461 for service. Contrary to most expert opinions, the Grand Trunk did leave at least one locomotive, the 5281, in unpainted brass as seen here. The remaining passenger service on the Central Vermont was handled in the mid-50s by the U1A class mountain types. Here, the 602 departs St. Albans. Nearing the end of the milk train era, we watch as an 080 switcher 504 shuttles a milk car at the St. Albans station. The CV remained loyal to Alco in the purchase of the eight P1As, 500 through 507, in 1923. Andy was again fortunate to get an invitation into the cab. 
we depart St. Albans in the 602-482. We wend our way through the northern Vermont countryside, then hold the main at Randolph for a meet with a brace of Montreal Locomotive Works FAs on a manifest freight. It was a crisp, cold day when Andy took a side trip to Graniteville, Vermont, the home of the Rock of Ages Granite Quarry. The diminutive steamers on the quarry's roster, including 062 T Hercules, were in action for us. The quarry still operates a tourist railroad, and the Hercules is preserved and on display. At Essex Junction, Vermont, a branch to the city of Burlington leaves the main line. At the ancient train shed, we watch the 602 make her station stop with Southward Train 332. North of Essex Junction, the local freight is in the charge of the 469 on one day and the 465 the next. We are back at the St. Albans Engine House. P1A504 is moved into its stall by the hostler. Andy was up early the next morning. In the pre-dawn darkness, the hostlers were already hard at work getting the fires on three consolidations in shape for the day's locals. The simmering, steaming machines provide ample evidence of the frosty temperature.
the Richford subdivision led northeast from St. Albans. The Richford local handled the industrial switching on the branch as well as the interchange with the St. Johnsbury and Lake Champlain and the Canadian Pacific Railroads. The Richford local attempts to depart St. Albans with the 465 on the head end and the 466 shoving at the rear. Despite the power, the cold stiffened bearings and the heavy grade brought the consoles to their knees. The stalled local was blocking the highway grade crossing. The crew made a hasty reverse move back into Italy Yard. Here they come again with a new head of steam. It looks like they'll make it this time. But what's this? A diesel on the rear. The Alco switcher kicks the local over the grade and cuts off on the fly. In the 1960s, the CV ran several excursions using Canadian Nationals Preserved 484, number 6218. The big U2G class Northern was a September 1942 product of the Montreal Locomotive Works. She will deadhead from White River Junction to New London, where an excursion will originate, running north to Brattleboro and return. The handsome machine is being prepared for the trip and is immaculate. After servicing, she is turned and backed onto her train.
We are able to catch up with the 6218 as she turns the photogenic curve in Tallinn, Connecticut. At West Willington, we join the faithful as the extra pounds southward. Connecticut countryside at its best. The 6218 glides along the valley, approaching Mansfield Depot. At Willimatta, Connecticut, the train passes under U.S. Route 6. Between Willimatta and New London, Andy was able to pace the 6218 for a considerable distance. We get one final run by on the deadhead move as we near New London. On the northbound leg of the trip, Andy was waiting at the photo curve in Tallinn. Then a quick run four miles north and she was again in his lens as she snaked around the tight curve in downtown Stafford Springs. The faithful then challenged the speed limits to the grade crossing at the north end of State Line siding for one more run by.
Again, we catch up with the special at Miller's Falls. We'll leave the special to continue its journey north while we return to some more freight action on the Palmer Sub. Don't worry, we'll catch up with it later in Brattleboro. Let's get back to the 50s on the Palmer Sub. It's brisk this Saturday, the 15th of February, 1955. There's the feel of snow in the air. The 472 is pulling hard in Munson and is making a great plume of smoke. By the time Bill could drive to Stafford Hollow Road, just a few miles south, snow really was in the air. The 472 is still pulling hard as she crests the grade. Another dash south for a mile on Route 32 gets us to a vantage point north of Stafford Springs. then once again at the photo curve in Tolland. The South Coventry Depot, though not used for passengers for decades, still stands guard over the white ballasted main in 1989. The 472 pounds past in snowy 1955. The 462 braves the winter weather in Munson. Again, the 462 is stepping through the white stuff, this time at the curve in Tolland. On this day in 1956, it's the 450's turn to whiten her pilot. In this moody shot, she's northbound around the curve and en route to her usual chores of switching at Stafford Springs.
After switching around for a time here at Stafford and having broken the fresh snow on the yard tracks, the venerable consolidation reassembles its train. See you in a few minutes at State Line. Here she comes again, our final look at the CV in the snow. As the 450 heads into the home stretch of her daily romp on the Palmer Sub. The 467 here is running south toward Amherst. then arrives at Palmer. This location is Willington, Connecticut. In a scene to warm a steam fan's heart, the 467 bails out a CN diesel with a long cut of reefers at Willimantic. The local down from Brattleboro climbs Belcher Town Hill. And arrives in Palmer. South of Palmer, this freight rolls through Monson and South Monson. The second scene is very near to the location of the cassette jacket photograph. The city of Willimantic was a very important railroad junction. Two lines of the New Haven Railroad crossed the CV at grade. In the mid-1950s, there was still a lot of traffic for the railroad. Here, the 450 has improved weather upon arrival at Willimantic Yard.
The 462 is working at Willimantic in this scene. After spotting a car, she runs around her train, then heads for East New London. We catch up with her again at South Wyndham. Recognize this Sioux boxcar? Yantic, Connecticut has several customers online. The local pulls through a truss bridge. On August 14, 1955, this wreck occurred as the result of a washout caused by a period of heavy rains. The New York Central steam crane assists in getting things cleared up. We conclude our tour of the Palmer subdivision through the lens of Bill Radcliffe. A work train is keeping the right of way neat near the state line siding. The 451 is in Three Rivers, Massachusetts. This view looks north at Tolland, the opposite side of the highway from the curve. is probably delivering those bunk cars to a work site. Now we can catch up with the 6218. Here she crosses the Connecticut River Bridge on the Boston and Maine and enters Brattleboro. After a reverse move to cross over into the yard, the 484 turns on the Y, where the huge CV 2104s were once turned.
The Connecticut River and the hills beyond provide a magnificent setting for the Canadian giant as she starts back to New London. The 6218 has been preserved by the Canadian National and is now on permanent display at Fort Erie, Ontario. She pulls hard through Miller's Falls. Our final scenes are of the 6218 on yet another excursion. We're unsure of the exact locations, but we think these scenes are a fitting way to end our visit to the Central Vermont Railway in steam. miles by rail and actually by highway it was only like uh, five and a half miles. The St. J and LC railroad track a sinuous pathway winds. It dips and dives and drops and climbs and twists and curves and bends till through the traveler's dizzied thoughts the fancy chased and ran. This railroad is constructed on the zig zag plan. This was a very mountainous run uh, at the time that i started we had uh, eight covered bridges that we used to go through and this was known as the route of the covered bridge the saint jay and lc passed through some of the most picturesque country in vermont but it was slow and subject to many derailments not to mention other unscheduled stops they were uh, 
moving along at their usual rate, then all of a sudden they stopped for no apparent reason out in the middle of nowhere. And uh, nothing happened, and nothing happened, and finally the lady got up and went to find the conductor. And she said, what has happened? And he said, well, we ran into a cow, but we'll be leaving now shortly. And uh, so they did. And they went along for about another hour, and all of a sudden they stopped again. And she went up to the conductor and said, now don't tell me we've hit another cow. And he said, no, ma'am, it's the same one. We just ran into her again. Now retired from CP Rail, Archie had nine years of his own adventures driving trains for the St. J and LC. All of a sudden, a guy running down the track stopped the train, put it in emergency. Uh, looked down the track, I couldn't believe my eyes, and uh, there was an elephant. So I called the dispatcher and I says, oh boy, we're in trouble again. I says, we're at Wilkett and we're stopped here and we're going to be delayed for a little while. He says, I told you, Archie, don't stop if you tell the section men, they'll take care of the problem. Well, I said, the problem isn't cows, it's elephants. And he hesitated for a minute, and he says, are they pink elephants? And I says, no. I says, they're gray. Matter of fact, two of them. What had actually happened was a circus truck on the highway, and he had a high trailer, and there was an underpass there at Wilkett, where the road went under the track, and he didn't clear and uh, tipped the trailer over. The elephants got out and got on the track. Never without problems, the St. J and L.C. struggled on into the late 20th century. Some railroads had much shorter histories and covered much shorter distances. One of them was a classic. The Woodstock uh, Railroad, or Railway as it became known after 1890, is generally regarded by rail historians and fans, of which I, I'm one, uh, uh, as the epitome of a short line, a branch, or a local railroad. It was exactly 13.88 miles long. It ran from Woodstock, Vermont, to White River Junction. Uh, it was first thought of in the 19, 1860s and uh, came to fruition in 1875. And for 58 years, it was Woodstock's link to the outside. The greatest engineering challenge on the Woodstock was bridging the Queechee Gorge. The first bridge was wooden with steel reinforcements and spanned the gulf at a height of 163 feet. On August 12, 1875, the old wood burner Winooski moved cautiously across the structure. Of course, the first uh, locomotives over it were weighed about 23 tons, and by the turn of the century, not only was the wear and tear being taken on it, but the locomotives were now up to 44 tons. And they brought in the current all steel bridge, and it was built by the American Bridge Company in 1911 for the princely sum of $26,000. That bridge still stands today and is Route 4. When the railroad was uh, disbanded, we, they sold the road up right away to the state of Vermont, who immediately laid a road there. And that is the basis of the, uh, of the Queechee Gorge Bridge today. So they did a pretty good job in 1911 for $26,000. Once it was up and running, the railroad provided both freight and passenger service to the area. Dewey's Mills and the Queechee Woolen Mill were steady customers and the prestigious Woodstock Inn was attracting ever-increasing tourist trade. I, at one time, they tell a story that you could go to New York's Grand Central Station and you'd see a nice, what they call an all-varnished car or a luxury car or with a sign on it saying, this car for Woodstock. And it would take about eight hours to get up to White River Junction and the little Woodstock would pick you up and bring you the last 14 or so miles to the station on Pleasant Street and start with a Concord coach, the inn's uh, uh, conveyance would meet you there and bring you to the Woodstock Inn. Tourists traveled from the depot to the inn by coach and later electric bus. The Woodstock Inn was to become one of New England's most attractive resorts, and the surrounding area would become an important leisure destination. Instead of numbering its locomotives, the Woodstock Railroad named them after men who had provided outstanding service. A.G. Dewey had been president of the railroad when it began construction.
The Woodstock's most famous president had achieved success building the Northern Pacific Railroad. Frederick Billings then turned his attention to his home state. He always did long for Vermont, like many native Vermonters, and when he retired from that, having made his fortune, he came home to Woodstock. And so that's another little unique thing about the 15.8 mile Woodstock Railroad. They got to get a local boy as who was former president of a transcontinental railroad to be their president. Billings died in 1890. In step with other railroads, the Woodstock was about to enter a period of relative prosperity. The glory days were ruled by steam. Today, its fascination and significance are preserved through the efforts of many groups and individuals. Mark Smith publishes books and magazines on railroading and builds steam equipment in his shop at home. Steam always fascinated me, and, and when I was a kid, I didn't know why. It, it just left me kind of moved, the, the sound of the whistle um, in the distance, um, the, the laboring locomotive with a heavy train, um, the express train going by so fast uh, that it took your breath away. It can be very, very quiet, almost whisper quiet. And on the other hand, it can blast and labor and thrash and wheels turning. In the early days, Vermonters themselves built steam engines at places like White River Junction and Lindenville. But the railroads bought most of their locomotives from out of state. They would buy the locomotives, and right away, there was maintenance required, um, adjusting bearings, for example, uh, inspecting parts for cracks and stuff like that. But also, um, the railroads did all their major overhaul work. So a lot of sophisticated uh, work went on in, in towns like Rutland, with the Rutland Railroad. Uh, uh, they had complete facilities. Um, certainly the Central Vermont in St. Albans had uh, very extensive facilities. They had a, a foundry that was built in here to make railroad parts, uh, wheels for the cars. There was a national car company which built railroad cars here. There was the uh, St. Albans steel mill which made iron and steel rail for the railroad. Uh, everything grew and grew and grew. Like other railroad towns, St. Albans prospered. It became headquarters of the central Vermont, and its buildings reflected the new optimism. Jim Murphy is a trustee of the St. Albans Historical Museum and a dispatcher with the New England Central Railroad. Well, we're standing on the main line of the, what used to be the Central Vermont Railway, of course, which was here for many, many years. But just beyond us, uh, about by about probably 50 feet, was the, uh, the train shed, which uh, was built in 1866 and 1867. There were four tracks across total, and it had four large arches portals that the, the trains would come in and out. Freestanding building, nothing in the center to hold up. It was all arched inside. They had to keep changing the size of the portal a bit over the years because the trains got bigger and bigger. The railroads built their stations to last and to please the eye, and the depot became the focal point of the community. There are many fine examples still standing throughout the state. First of all, the depot was always a dignified structure. The railroads tended to overbuild everything, their locomotives, their facilities, their bridges and whatnot. Well, they overbuilt the depots, and many of them were just splendid architectural buildings. This is the Shelburne Railroad Station at Shelburne Museum, built in 1890 by Dr. William Seward Webb, who's father-in-law of Electra Webb, who founded the Shelburne Museum. All kinds of activity went on here. Of course, passenger ticketing, uh, express, uh, freight, telegraph, and uh, it has. It's an interesting station. It's an attractive station. It has two waiting rooms: men's at one end, women at the other. I'm not sure that it was compulsory, but uh, women could avoid tobacco chewing, spitting, swearing, and so on and so forth. The depot was where you met trains arriving from distant, exotic places where you went for news, where you saw a visiting dignitary. It was where you met a loved one. In the old days, the depot 
was the heart of the town. Stay tuned, Northern Railroads, Vermont and her neighbors. Labor. And I worked up to the position of, of a locomotive hostler. Now, a hostler is a position where you handle the locomotives once they are brought in off the road. And you handle them for servicing. That is for coaling, for watering, fire cleaning, turning. And in this particular instance here in Bellows Falls, which was a small terminal, we also were responsible for doing a considerable amount of mechanical work that was within our ability to accomplish. The uh, Rutland, of course, terminated here, and uh, from a historical standpoint, it'd be interesting to note the Rutland was the first railroad in Bubble Swamp. The steel roads connected Vermont communities with each other and with the outside world. In junction towns like Bellows Falls, the growth was impressive. I had the CB running through here, the B&M had the Rutland coming in here, it was a main line from Boston to Montreal. About 10 trains a day, 10 or 12. And they had switchers working it in three different yards here. It was, it was a booming railroad town. Business was booming for Vermont Farm Machine, who shipped their goods far afield. Vermont Farm made what they called a Davis swing churn, which was all wood, and you rocked it back and forth like a cradle. They also had barrel churns at turns. And that was one of the big industries here. They shipped all over the world. The railroads brought new trade and prosperity to the towns they served. Salesmen arrived by train and stayed at busy hotels. Milk and other agricultural products traveled out of the state. Goods and people moved through at an ever-increasing pace. The Rutland had always sought to outflank the central Vermont. Back at the turn of the century, it devised a spectacular plan. The Causeway across Lake Champlain between uh, Colchester and uh, South Hero came into being in 1900. And again, this was to bypass the central Vermont, because even up to that point, in order to get to the, uh, to the west, they were obligated to go over the CV between Burlington and uh, St. Albans and thence over to Rouse's Point. Thrusting more than three miles across open water, the causeway provided direct connection with the west. Rutland trains would thread their way along it for the next 60 years. Huge slabs of scrap marble were used as fill along the causeway, now empty of the traffic which used to rumble across the lake. We camped for years at Colchester Point where the uh, Rutland, the long Rutland fill took off across for South Hero. And the arrangement, the way the trees were and everything, when a northbound train came out, you knew it was coming. Couldn't hear it very much. As soon as it got free, get free of the trees, it was almost like a loud explosion. In the Rutland's case, they finally did achieve some sort of uh, practicality because they were a link between a greater network of uh, traffic between Boston and in Chicago in the Midwest by virtue of the fact that the trains could come up the Bellows Falls and then go on the Rutland up through the causeway that was built across the islands. It was the, the, the glory years for the Rutland when that particular situation was, was in vogue. For some people, the glory years meant opulence and luxury. Dr. William Seward Webb was ambitious and well-connected. Thwarted in his plans to become governor of New York, he sought that office in Vermont. He married a Vanderbilt girl, which tied him in with the New York Central, and the New York Central sent him up here to, to see if the Central wanted to take over the Rutland Railroad, and they decided against it finally, but when, when in Vermont, he fell in love with the countryside and established what is now Shelburne Farms. As president of the Rutland, Webb toured the rails of the line aboard the luxuriously appointed inspection engine, Nahasane, which he had brought with him from New York. I also should mention that he was president of the Wagner Palace Car Company. 
which built the Grand Isle, which is here also at the museum. It's all mahogany panel, it seats 10 people. It has an observation room at the rear uh, by the platform, uh, two bedrooms, dining room, secretary's room, and a room for the porter and or cook. Dr. Webb never became governor of Vermont, but the Rutland Railroad was profitable under his management, with a good deal of support from the New York Central. It was an optimistic time, but railroading has never been without peril. Perhaps the most vivid example was the disaster at what was called the Woodstock Bridge. Today, at West Hartford, a steel bridge crosses the White River. A century earlier, in February 1887, it was made out of wood. It was here that the central Vermont experienced the worst train wreck in its history. The night train in coming north uh, out of White River Junction uh, struck a piece of rail which had a break in it. The rail was actually broken out. Some of the cars uh, toppled off the bridge, off the trestle, onto the frozen uh, White River. The uh, oil lamps and the uh, stoves that were in each car immediately caught fire. But not only did it just burn up the cars, but because the bridge was also wood, it completely burned this four or five span bridge also, and there was nothing left when the fire was done. Uh, when it was all over, there were 25 passengers dead, and five crew members were also killed. After it rebuilt the bridge, the Central Vermont loaded it up with a dozen locomotives to demonstrate its strength. A decade earlier, a remarkable feat of engineering had been completed in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. A group of railroad enthusiasts have gathered at the train station in Conway, New Hampshire for an historic event. Gordon Evans and his brother Raymond have joined members of their family for the occasion, the first passenger train through Crawford Notch in 37 years. The Conway Scenic Railroad is launching its new excursion line to Crawford Station on the tracks of the main Central Mountain Division, descendant of the old Portland and Ogdensburg Railroad. For the Evans brothers, the trip has special meaning. It will take them past the house high on Mount Willard, where they grew up. The train works its way to Bartlett through the beautiful Sackle River Valley. The stop in Bartlett affords an extra photo opportunity for rail fans. In the days of the Mountain Division, Bartlett was a busy station, handling passengers and freight traffic bound for distant locations. Here, extra power was added for the steep ascent which lay ahead. For the steam locomotives, the climb through the notch was a real challenge. The railroad gains almost 1,400 feet from North Conway to the Crawford Station. There is one section nine miles long that rises at a rate of 116 feet to the mile. To haul the heavier freight up the grade, helper engines were added at both ends of the train. Today's train ride will carry the Evans brothers over familiar ground. At the site of the old Bemis station, now known as Notchland, there is music to celebrate the event. Trees have filled the once open ravine below the spectacular Frankenstein trestle. The train passes over Willie Brook Bridge, approaching the site where once stood the section house that was home to the Evans family during the early years of the century. The house was built in 1887 for workers who maintained the two-mile section of track carved into the side of the mountain. 
In 1903, Loring Evans, the father of Gordon and Raymond, was hired as a section foreman and moved into the house with his wife, Hattie. Once a week, she'd send her daughter into G.K. Howard. He was the one that had the store in Batman. And what she'd want for the week, and she'd, they'd put it on the train, the baggage car, and sometimes they'd take it to Crawford's, and the section men would take it down, or sometimes they'd stop at the house and put it off at the house. The railroad was their main link to the world. It brought coal, groceries, and clothing from the valley. And it brought the doctor who delivered the four Evans children. It was also the railroad that carried the children to school. Because of the steep grade, an unusual method was devised for getting them aboard. We went to school with Favens, and the train in the winter could not stop because this went on a curve, and he'd just spin, set there and spin. And uh, my mother would space us 40 feet apart or something like that. And the conductor, and the brakeman probably, would scoop us on. The winters on the steep slopes of Mount Willard were rugged, and the deep snows always a threat. Well, we had a lot of snow in those days. We had monstrous snow slides off the ledges of Mount Willard. And then we had a telephone in the house. And then when the snow slide came, we had to call Bartlett so they would send a snow plow up ahead of the passenger train or freight train. It was snowing on Thanksgiving Day in 1913 as Loring Evans cleared switches at Crawford's. Well, it was a stormy day, and you know, of course the engine was, he thought it was going to go on to Fabian's. Never done, but they backed up onto the side track, and he was shoveling the side track out, switches and everything. He misunderstood the engineer's signal and was struck and killed by the backtracking helper engine. Patty was left with the four children and a decision to make. Well, afterwards, they decided to talk with her. And she could stay on and board the section men, uh, leave whatever she wanted to do. Of course, then she didn't know anything different, so she stayed right there and boarded the section men. And we lived in one part of the house, one side of the house, and the section crew lived on the other side. Patty raised her family and continued to cook for the section crew. She would remain on the mountain for another 30 years. Passenger trains would continue to run through the gateway and on into Vermont until 1958. After ceremonies at the Crawford Station, it's back through the notch and down the mountain. For each traveler, the trip has its own meaning. For the Evans brothers, it has meant revisiting the pathways of their early years and reliving some special moments. Rain was coming down hard on the 3rd of November, 1927. People in northern New England were not surprised. October had been an unusually wet month. But this was a torrential storm lasting two days. The ground was saturated and the rivers were already swollen. It would prove to be the worst disaster in the history of the region for its people and for its railroads. There were always wrecks up and down the line, but the 27 flood, uh, November 3rd and 4th of 1927, happened at a time when there were no flood control on any of the rivers. Dams broke various places, culverts washed out, and uh, when it was all over, uh, the state's railroad system had been uh, virtually decimated. At Proctor, the station almost floated away, and the tracks washed out under Rutland's milk train number 88, stranding it and its crew. The city of Rutland was not spared as the raging waters destroyed rails and bridges.
Though the flood crippled the Rutland Railroad, it all but destroyed the central Vermont. Everything on the central Vermont Railway, almost from around Sharon, Vermont, up to Williston, almost every bridge and all the roadbed, uh, everything was completely annihilated. The head of the railroad here called on the Canadian National to help out to rebuild the railroad. And they sent down, I believe it was somewhere around 1,600 people, along with equipment, uh, to rebuild the railroad. It was a monumental effort. The main line was back in service in three months, and a ceremony was held on the steps of the Capitol. But the central Vermont could not pay the bill for the reconstruction. Well, uh, the TV had no choice, but they had a foreclosure sale. And at the foreclosure sale, the representative of the Canadian National Railway purchased the Central Vermont Railway for $22 million. And the Canadian National took over control of the Central Vermont from, from that time on. There were virtually no railroads that escaped unscathed. Uh, some of the marginal, smaller operations, uh, this was the end. They just didn't have the money. They didn't have the economic future to even rebuild even think about rebuilding. In the early 30s, many of the short lines in New England disappeared, battered by the flood, the depression, and the steady advance of the automobile. Following its early financial struggles, the Woodstock Railroad had enjoyed a period of success, but revenues had been declining steadily throughout the 20s. The decision was made in 32. The handwriting was on the wall. It was one of those things that had been on a little railroad. No one wanted to face it, but uh, there was really no choice. It was decided that the last run would be made on April 15th, the day before Easter in 1933, at the very height of the Great Depression. Remember, I was 16 years old at the time, and the Woodstock Railroad Station and that had always been my playground as a kid, because I lived right across from the railroad right there. And uh, so I was anxious to go on the ride. So I know we went down to the station early and stood in line to get a ticket. There was quite a few people going, a little small office there. At 11 o'clock, Ivan McCarty closed the ticket office. Charles Furbrick came out. and saw that everyone was on board, and he called to H.H. H. Payne, uh, uh, who was the engineer, to go ahead. A man by the name of George Piper was the fireman, and uh, the train pulled out of Woodstock shortly after 11 a.m. Just beyond Dewey's Mills is a slight elevation called Shelley's Hill. And the train started up that hill, and the wheels kept spinning. It didn't get anywhere. Somebody put axle grease on the rails, and the train had to make three passes to climb up over this steep grade. Sometime within the last year, someone came out and put a piece in the Vermont Standard, our local newspaper, to admit that he was one that was involved in that. Finally, they got up over it and uh, had their luncheon on White River. And the train reversed for Woodstock, tolling its bell all the way home to its depot. Uh, I've also had people tell me of various ages in the village that uh, throughout the whole thing, people turned out to wave goodbye to it. The engineer uh, acknowledged every one of them, and more than one tear was shed on that day. movies out there, and they had a lot of, well, what you'd call summer stock today. They had shows out there. Now, this one here is, that's the car stopping at the ball field out the Barber's Park. And everybody's, the game must have started because they're all bailing off of there in a hurry.
As would soon be the case with steam locomotives, the trolleys of New England would disappear, brought down by an agent of change that didn't ride on rails. It was the automobile when Henry started putting out Model Ts and everybody started getting the car and you know, didn't want to ride the trolley anymore. There wasn't enough business when they finally went bankrupt in, in 1925. And shortly afterwards, they tore up the rails and stuff. The Rowland uh, went into bankruptcy uh, in 1938. And uh, there were some pretty tough times immediately following that. There was a lot of question whether the railroad could survive. Uh, among the various ideas that, that came about, and probably one of the most successful was to save the Rutland Club, which was organized. And they succeeded in hiring uh, professional traffic people uh, to come in and, and help improve their traffic base. One of the ideas, of course, was the uh, inauguration of a fast freight service, as they called it, train, and the train was called the Whippet. They were able to offer good service, and they offered it at a slightly reduced rate, which was an incentive to the shipper. This was one of the successful ventures that the Save the Rutland Club came about with, and it did increase their traffic to a considerable degree. Other lines emphasized more glamorous features in their promotions. Once upon a winter's day, Grand Central Terminal hummed with excitement. The Snow Express was about to depart. It's best to get your tickets early for when departure time... Starting in the early 30s, ski trains ran north out of cities like New York and Boston. Except for the war years, they continued throughout the 40s, bringing skiers to the resorts that were springing up in New England. ...for a weekend in Vermont or New Hampshire or in Canada. And you pulled out of Grand Central and chugged right along the New York, New Haven, and Hartford, changing engines in, in, in uh, uh, New Haven as usual. And then after that, you really didn't know much about it because you were in bed and asleep. You were wakened by the, by the change of the engines at Dover. They stopped in Ossipee to let people off, and they stopped in Conway and North Conway, and then Intervale was the end. And then you had breakfast, and then you were all set pretty much to go off to ski school, which started at 10. Across the river in Vermont, ski trains also raced north, carrying skiers to the slopes around the state, including the trails on Mount Mansfield at Stowe. Ski instructors were on hand to help novices and advanced skiers alike perfect their techniques, and maybe provide other diversions. Well, besides skiing, I met a very attractive ski instructor. And it took me two or three times coming before he really, really noticed me. <laughs> so that was the beginning of, we've been married now, what, 54 years nearly. The ski trains disappeared as passenger and freight service gave way to the advance of cars and trucks. Once again, the Rutland was struggling, but things would change with the arrival of a new president. Gardner Caverly. And he brought about what is termed and what I feel was a rebirth of the Rutland. When he came on board, there was about 60 steam locomotives still in existence on the Rutland. A study was made, a professional study made, and it was found that the Rutland could be operated with a total of about 15 diesel units, where it took about 60 steam engines. And he was successful in getting banking to start dieselizing the railroad. Across the country, diesel power was pushing steam locomotives onto the siding. Vermont was late to make the change, but it was inevitable. The demands of efficiency were writing the final chapter of a remarkable story. This is a steam locomotive, uh, uh, the number 220. It's, uh, it's a 488 at all, and, and uh, it, so uh, it normally was built for passenger service, but we did use it in way freight service. And, uh, uh, but it hand-fired engine, 
and uh, that was the old glory days. They called the shovel, as you shoveled in the coal, they called old the banjo. And you was, if you could play the banjo good, you would be all right. Jim Findley came up to St. Albans from Alabama in 1946 and went to work for the Central of Vermont as a fireman during the last days of steam. Six years later, he was on the roster as an engineer. I fired this engine uh, uh, back when we had the steam. I fired this engine. I fired many others. But uh, this one was uh, used uh, sometimes in a wave rate, used it in a fashion train. When you start your train, uh, you let off your brake. You have that stand there. You pull it out just a little bit. And you get it started, get the slack out of the train, you know. And, and uh, as you got going, and you got on the main line where you could highball, then you then you keep pulling it out, and they bring this bar wheel on up here. And this is the old John, called the Johnson bar. That's your, your gear. You hook it up or lower down low and work it real hard. Or when you're out there highballing, you you bring it up here real high, almost near, up near the center. This is the valve which uh, uh, furnishes the steam with the ratio. If you set with the Johnson bar up in the cab, puts steam into the piston and drives it back there, back and forth. It come in and up, push it back, and then it come back in and push it forward. It's top eight, back eight, top and bottom corner. Forward eight, back eight, top and bottom corner. That's the, that's the ratio is set up. During Jim Fendley's early days as an engineer, a strict timetable applied to all trains, whether passenger or freight. The first train I caught was the milk train from St. Albans to White River. And those days, they were hot on the running time between stations. And if you, if you didn't make your time between stations, boy, they'd be on your neck. You, they'd be, the wires would get hot. You'd have to write on a note and tell them why you didn't make your run time. <laughs> so that, that, was, that was back in the old railroad days where they were, were real railroad. These diesels, you know, that took all the thunder out of railroad. The old steamers was it. Just loved the old steamers. Woody's eating out the garden. Some retired railroad employees have gathered for their annual luncheon at White River Junction. About half the men work for the Boston and Maine, the others for the central Vermont. White River Junction was once a very busy railroad town. I've seen times when I, when I started in the uh, first part of the 50s where that platform down there was literally covered with people. There's trains sitting on every track. They just came in or they're getting ready to go. Well, I worked in White River Junction as a telegraph operator. I worked third trick most of the time and uh, work relief job here. Uh, we had uh, three sets of operators here on the station and three down in the yard. Today, freight traffic through White River Junction is sparse, and passenger service is reduced to the single daily trip that Amtrak's Vermonter makes in each direction. And on this side was the main station. This was the express office, Railway Express. And uh, this was the baggage room here. And the main passenger station was here. Uh, they had a, a restaurant in there where you could get a pretty good meal. For the railroads that came to this town, freight trains paid the bills, and passenger service brought the prestige. White River Junction had its share of both. From Montreal, trains arrived on two routes, the Central Vermont and the combined Boston and Maine Canadian Pacific Line. Sometime back in that era, they had about 32 passenger trains in and out of here. I seen times when the B&M yard, they had 17 tracks, a set-off track, and a running track. And every one of those would be full of freight cars. This was one of the busiest stations in New England. Like the central Vermont, the Boston and Maine had its glory years. It maintained an extensive network of tracks in New Hampshire, and B&M trains were a familiar sight in Vermont as well. The line was a favorite among photographers, and during the final days of steam, its classic features were documented by many people, most notably by Philip Hastings. Phil Hastings was um, brought up in Bradford, Vermont, which is on the Connecticut River and also um, on the Boston, Maine, uh, north-south uh, main line. Between, uh, White River Junction and Wells River. And right from the start, his, his photographs um, had a unique quality. Phil um, had the sensitivity and the awareness to make each one of his pictures a composite. He saw it all. One of my favorite pictures 
um, was taken at Bradford just at twilight. And it was along the train, and the RPO clerk was loading the last of the mail. And what you saw was a community at train time. Although the short lines are almost entirely gone, the trunk lines in Vermont are still active. While passenger service is more glamorous, freight has always been the revenue generator for the railroads. The railroad industry right now is probably as healthy as it has been at any time in history. The railroads are handling more freight uh, than they did at any time in history, including the peak years during World War II, which were the previous records. Today, the New England Central hauls freight along the same road traveled by the CV. And because of decisive action by the state of Vermont, the old Rutland tracks are still in use. The state got into the picture and purchased the right-of-way of the Rutland Railroad and they did this with taxpayers' money, and I, I think legitimately so, in order to preserve the opportunity to have rail transportation within the state. And likewise, it was the case with the uh, Bellows Falls branch from Rutland to Bellows Falls. And uh, that's operated by a different company, the Green Mountain Railroad, but they're doing very well, too. And interestingly enough, on the Bellows Falls branch, they run a tourist train, which has been very successful for a number of years. The Green Mountain Flyer carries passengers through historic Vermont landscapes from Bellows Falls to Chester and back. In restored wooden coaches, complete with varnished interiors and plush upholstery, travelers can experience something of the magic of railroading as it used to be. The train is part of the landscape. There's a look-alike kind of homogenized quality to traveling nowadays but in railroading the railroads always travel through the landscape whether it's meadows or mountains it's a unique encounter with the landscape the uh, railroad industry uh, as the saying goes gets in one's blood what what starts it I don't know it just gets in your blood I've been retired now since 1988, and I go around the railroad and print every day to see what's going on. Oh, it seems to get in your blood, I don't know. Yeah, for some reason it does. You, you get attached to it, and you stick with it. You stick with it.
This program was made possible by a grant from the Robert Fleming and Jane Howe Patrick Foundation. We're racing to the end of the WGBH fiscal year at midnight on August 31st, seven days from now. So many of you have already called, but we still have over $800,000 left to raise. We can make it across the finish line with your support. Act now and thanks. Well, in the mid-1800s, when train service came to northern New England, it was uh, not very long before trains started running on time here in New England. You'd set your watch by the conductor's pocket watch that he had right there as we're learning on this wonderful program. Well, we've got a time problem at WGBH. We've got a long way to go between now and August 31st and not much time in which to do it. That's why I want you to come forward right now and dig deep and make your pledge to Channel 2. If you pledge $80 right now, we'd love to send you the video of this program produced by our sister station, Vermont Educational Television, up in Burlington, Vermont, for you. And it's yours for a pledge of $80. All you have to do is ask for it, and you'll automatically become a member of WGBH. You'll get a year's subscription to GBH, the members' magazine. You'll get the discounts at many of the area's most popular educational and cultural institutions. And you'll also be helping us produce and broadcast the very best programs there are on television. So as you learn about the railroads of northern New England, and as you think about your own travels on trains, and you think about your own life, think about what Channel 2 has done for you and make your pledge as large as you possibly can. Now don't forget, if you haven't called, this is the time to do it. To go to your phone, to call 492-1111, and to make your pledge. Thanks very much for your support right now. Use our 800 toll-free number, and don't forget to use your Visa, MasterCard, or American Express card when you call. Many, many thanks. If you like museums, did you know that as a member of WGBH, you're entitled to significant discounts at great museums like the Computer Museum, the Institute of Contemporary Art, the Children's Museum, the Sports Museum, and the New England Quilt Museum, just by showing your WGBH member card. These are only a few of over 250 New England locations that offer terrific money-saving discounts to WGBH members. Don't miss out. Become a member today. Well, those member discount organizations are a wonderful way to extend your membership, and train travel is a wonderful way to see New England. This is a time for you to call right now. See you, folks. Have a great time wherever you're going. The romance of train travel. One of the things that Channel 2 has been talking about in this program. I used to travel on the trains when I was young, and you know, I'm old enough to remember the steam trains coming through, those big puffs of smoke going before everything switched over to diesel. It was a wonderful time, and it really changed the way New England works and the way our whole economy works. Of course, uh, villages and towns spreading uh, and starting up along the train tracks here and there. I hope you'll do what you can to help us produce the best programs there are on television anywhere whether they have to do with trains or whether they have to do with the best symphony music that there is or whether they have to do with the best drama or take you uh, to wonderful places that you could never go to any other way but on television. I hope that you'll support this right now as we race to the end of our fiscal year, August 31st. That's it. It's over then at midnight on August 31st and we've got a lot of money to raise if you've been watching. So go to your phone, call us right now, become a WGBH member if you're not and don't forget for $80, we'll send you this video, Northern Railroads, Vermont and her neighbors. Call right now. And here's another reason to give right now. As far as, far as I'm concerned, uh, Public TV and WGBH are the, are the best bargain we've got. They provide access for me and my family to, to events and performances in places that, that would be prohibitive otherwise. Uh, how else am I going to get a front row seat on a live performance of the three tenors? visit museums around the world, uh, travel from continent to continent. I mean, it provides access to, to ideas and people and places and sites that just wouldn't be possible uh, without public TV. Well, I hope that persuaded you to pick up your phone and call us at 492-1111. These uh, rusty rails right here used to be the siding right here in Lincoln, Massachusetts. The, uh, Freight cars used to pull in here and get loaded with stock or with vegetables for the, for the market in town. Used to be market gardens around here. Things are changing a lot. It's one of the old 
rusty railroad spikes. Think how the railroad has really changed things in New England. And think of all the changes that Channel 2 has documented and watched over the years that it's been doing the best television that there is. I hope you'll support it right now as we race to the end of our fiscal year on August 31st. Don't forget, we'd love to send you the videotape of this program. Call and pledge $80, or if you'd like to pledge $60, we'll send you the WGBH t-shirt, and you'll still be a member of WGBH. We'd like you to sign up as a member if you're not, and if you already are, how about an extra gift between now and August 31st? Thanks.